Boy. Give me an R. R. Give me an XR. XR. What if this was the whole presentation? Uh, thank you so much for being here, especially early in the morning. We are on board XR, which is a toolkit platform community that allows any live performer to put their creative practice into web-based virtual reality. Um, and of course, because I'm told the Wi-Fi gods are not with us, we have everyone's favorite, a 2D clip of a 3D experience. Yeah. So we're just going to share that to kind of set our stage. Or will we? Technology, why? We should have done it live. Is there a way to skip to the next slide? <laughs> Maybe. It's going so great. I should have stuck with the R's. We were really off to the I know. races. We, were, we started off well. Didn't we? All right, that's it. Perform it. Everyone stand up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Are you all able to cue it from back there? There's a thing. So all the experiences that you just saw a glimpse of were performed live inside of a web browser, and some by the artist on this stage and in this audience here today. Um, and what makes it very special is this is actually the first time most of us are meeting in physical space for the first time ever, which is so exciting after collaborating yeah. for two years. I'm Brendan Bradley, an actor and scrappy storyteller. I founded the Integrative Technology Lab at New York University, and I'm the artistic director of Onboard XR. Um, I'm going to take us on our journey that led us to AWE here today, and then I'll hand it over to Rebecca Evans, who's going to talk about what it's like to devise new work in this space. And then Michael Moran is going to present our queuing system that allows us to trigger scenery changes, lighting changes, avatars changes inside of a web browser. And then Clemence de Beg is going to blow our minds with what it looks like when you take a very early prototype and keep iterating into a cutting edge live performance, actually putting motion capture inside of a web browser. And a quick shout out to Alex Coulomb, who's been a participant in Onboard XR, and Jason and Valerian from Active Replica, who have been participating with us as well. Um, I want to set the stage real fast, our stage. There are a lot of incredible platforms out there for doing virtual reality work as well as virtual work. Um, however, many of them require a very specific piece of hardware or software that you have to access, which can limit the audiences and the artist access to these tools. So what we've been using is Mozilla's web-based platform Hubs, which is open and actually won an Augie Award last night for Collaborative Tool. Uh, to be able to iterate and customize a queue system for any artist in the world and any audience member in the world to access virtual performance on whatever device they already own. And we think this opens us up to the trifecta of live experiences, which is live responsive entertainment, immersive technology, and accessibility. And over the last 18 months, these three pillars have let us support over 20 live performances uh, and put money in the pockets of over 50 creators. Now, looking at a little more complicated data numbers, data points, I, I hear that's very important to do. Um, we've seen relatively low adoption to early VR use in the US. However, our audiences, 19%, have chosen to pay $20 for a pay-what-you-want virtual reality experience. And I think that bears repeating. This is experimental robot feeder with no budget, no celebrities, and no marketing. And there's an audience out there that's willing to pay more than Netflix to come watch it, which is absolutely incredible. And I think that this is really attached to that accessibility pillar. The fact that one in three attendees report that our work is their first ever experience with virtual reality or live virtual reality work. Um, so how did we get here? Um, we started. In July of 2020, when I released a free 3D model on Mozilla Hubs of a playhouse so that any performer stuck at home could actually remount some of their work from their living room, which got picked up and adopted by a lot of folks. Uh, Alex Coulomb, as well as David Gotchfield, Roman Militich, 
uh, Kevin Labson, and was there more people? <laughs> there were so many more people, it feels like, at this point. Um, but we decided to mount one of my one-act plays, Jettison, inside of this stage to kind of see what it would be like to take three actors from three different cities and put them in the same virtual reality boat. We then wanted to see if we could scale these efforts so that anybody in the world could bring their creative practice into web-based VR. And so we've created these seasonal sprints that we've done four of in March of 2021, July of 2021, October of 2021, and this February of 2022. And what this looks like is a seasonal sandbox where we allow any artist in the world to propose a, pro a project that they want to stand up, kind of a short piece, a small act, a vertical slice, if you will. We intake them and teach them about our community, our toolkit. We offer soft support to optimize, bring up some of their assets, get them into a codified run of show, get them comfortable with the tools. We have stage and house management that helps them stabilize this showcase and put it into a linear show of acts that we can switch between as part of an evening of shorts. We have MCs that help onboard the audience members, improvise, troubleshoot with them, and take them through the narrative journey. And then we monetize this uh, and share all revenues from a pay what you want ticket, as well as any awards like the Augie Awards that Onboard was nominated for last night. So this elevates all the work of all of our creators. And many of these creators have taken their prototype from Onboard XR and actually gone on to secure future funding, future production, or future performance opportunity. As we expanded into the back half of our showcases in the last year, we started partnering with known festivals to offer preceding or programming for these kind of live experiences. So we partnered with Fivers in October 2021, and very excitingly, we partnered with Mozilla Festival in March, uh, which allowed us to kind of come back to our roots and put our festival inside of Mozilla's own corporate festival. And thanks to our partners at Active Replica, they actually allowed us to bring some of that interoperability that people talk about in the metaverse, where we were a part of the physical footprint or the virtual footprint of the conference, where you could actually walk from the conference, one of the panels, one of the rooms, one of the breakout rooms, into our theater lobby and attend one of the live shows, even though we were across different servers, which is a very cool glimpse at what might be possible as we begin to connect these different worlds and experiences. Uh, we also started branching out into some client work. We got approached by the Polys to do the first ever live halftime show in the metaverse. <laughs> it's very fun of taking some of our more stable acts and combining them together into a live show. And then we've also begun doing what we consider to be loose main stages, where we've taken prototypes that have a little bit more promise, maybe a little bit of funding, and we've offered them a roadmap to build out into a more full format show. One of these being a live interactive musical that started as a single song in October and was presented in December as a full-fledged musical inside of an IMAX theater where we dealt with a hybrid audience both virtually as well as projecting the browser experience on the IMAX screen. So that's what we've been able to accomplish in 18 months, which feels a little crazy at this point. <laughs> um, and from where we sit, what we're really excited about is that there is this audience and this artist space that is excited about live, immersive, and accessible work. Now, we're always looking to kind of scale our efforts, invite as many people as possible, so our current season of onboard is actually asynchronous. Rather than it being a two to three week sprint where we onboard artists, we've created a video series on our Discord channel that allows people to self-generate and self-onboard themselves at their own schedule. And what we've seen, which is really exciting, is in our first month, we've seen more people begin the 21-day challenge to bring their creative practice into virtual reality than all of our applicants from the entire history of Onboard. And our Discord community has tripled in size. So I really think that if you build it, they will come. There is an audience out there. There is a creator community out there. And if we can empower them with the tools, they do want to innovate and, and work in this space. A 21-day challenge that I just talked about. <laughs> um, this guides us to what I believe is the, re the real underlying value of Onboard XR, which is experience as a service, a fleet of talent and tools to support accessible live experiences in the immersive web and develop the next generation of interactive storytellers. And we do this by educating, inspiring, accelerating, and empowering them. Now, this falls into two categories. There is the 
actual content experiences that can be programmed or offered to different people, especially as we have these ghost towns of these beautiful different platforms and communities that don't have programming, and we can bring that programming to those communities. But also just the actual tangible experience of these humans that are doing beautiful, innovative work and getting experience with what it's like to run a live event in these spaces. And I think that this experience, at a ser experience as a service helps us populate what is the question of the live metaverse moving forward. So in 18 months, we've had a lot of success. We're very grateful for where we come. And we invite anyone in this community if you want to bring your work on board. And to show you how to do that, I'll have Rebecca Evans come up here and talk about how to devise in the space. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brendan. It's a thrill to be here with everyone on the stage. Like we said, it's been, wow, we just met each other for the first time physically. So we all know how important that is, right? Like we're here together in a physical space. So my name is Rebecca Evans. I have produced and choreographed and created stories uh, in a bunch of different ways. Um, in the water as a synchronized swimmer, in the air on in trapeze, um, on stage and other fo in places. And I really like to try and engage uh, everyone in the experience as possible. And so a lot of people say, right, you've probably all heard this, oh, VR isn't real, what you're experiencing is just fake. And it's not true, right? So what we try and do in Onboard and in these experiences is come forward, right? <laughs> come forward. Like, like I did before we started the talk today. And that's because we want everyone to feel present. And in these spaces, whether or not you have embodied avatars or not, uh, everyone's here together. So let's give a little wave to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give a little wave to the people who are going to be seeing this in the future. And thank you to the people of the past, the Tamian people, on whose land we're on in Santa Clara. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is kind of creating that space together and to immerse yourselves in the story. So has anyone here been to a theater performance in VR of any type? I know we've got a few here in the front row. OK, cool. Thank you so much. Because it's, it's kind of amazing to be able to, uh, you know, like I could go swim, but now in VR, everyone can swim together. We don't really have to teach each other how to do that. But we can have a story in the water. And one of the cool things about Onboard is this kind of subtle water theme. So, <laughs> so you'll notice that the, so the two shows that I've done uh, for Onboard XR 2 and 3 do have a water element. The first one um, I've been investigating in world building to recreating history, but then kind of in your own way, what does that mean, right? And really examining that. So we have this amazing ship that's docked to, uh, about two hours away from here in Stockton. It was built in the 50s and it's, it got abandoned and now it's being cleaned up. And this ship over here was in a James Bond film as the Spectre yacht. <laughs> And it's also been in, in Baywatch. So I thought, how funny would it be to get people to reenact a Baywatch scene on this fake ship in virtual reality, <laughs> right? Come on, who would want to do that? So thanks to Brendan Bradley, he actually gave me the Queen Mary model. So we were able to, in my very goofy, quickly improvised performance with two other amazing improv actors, enable people to go through six decades of history in about six minutes. And then we pushed the bad captain over the side. It was great. Right? We all did it together as part of the same audience. So then for the next, um, for the next show that I did called The Aquians, uh, it's basically, uh, it's a little more than an evil mermaid show. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to talk about is creating the world a little bit for these pieces and specifically for The Aquians. So uh, folks here, who's into world building? Um, I really enjoy it, so I'm not a developer per se, but with the tools in Mozilla Hubs and other platforms, you know, someone like myself who may be technically capable but not a developer specifically, you can do so much. And I think that's what's really amazing about Onboard is that we provide a community and resources and, you know, if you're willing to step up to the plate or swim into the murky waters, <laughs> we, can, we can bring forth some additional um, skill and asset level to whatever world that you're creating. So when you're going to make an XR theater piece, you want to make sure that you're not making it uh, too heavy, in a sense having too many elements or too many assets. So w with my evil mermaid 
show, and there's more to it, but I won't, I won't go into detail. <laughs> so so I, I found this beautiful mermaid up here in the upper right. Okay, cool, I'm gonna have a, a mermaid model in my mermaid show. Well, then I pulled up over here. This is the panel of stats, and that's the bad news. The, the mermaid was too beautiful to be in the show. Uh, and that's the thing with, uh, when, you're, when you're working with these web-based platforms, and then we're working with multiple people backstage, on stage, in headset, and the, and the audience, you all, plus we have ghost audience who are not embodied as avatars, but also watching. So all of that together combined makes sort of heavy assets to be streaming. Uh, and so we want to be really careful with how big we're making our world. And that makes it, you know, it's kind of like duct tape and staples. You just got, you've got to make it really simple. And so we know that you, you've seen some amazing, beautiful, high fidelity worlds, and we can do those things too, but for this particular instance, we're just making it really simple because we are building off of each other. So all the props that are spawned, so if my scene comes first and I spawn some props, I actually need to clean up my stuff before the next performer comes on right next. So like a good Girl Scout, I need to clean up my space and leave, thank you, and leave my campfire <laughs> in a better situation than it was. Uh, music, animation, sound effects, all these things also, of course, contribute to creating a space that everyone is really feeling engaged in. So in terms of integrating the production, when I had my story, then you start to think about, okay, well now how much time do I have left, right? Onboard is like an eight-week hackathon. <laughs> so hackathon friends, right? We know how tiring that can be. So stretch that to an eight-week hackathon. And what you're doing is, uh, we've got kind of a, a loose schedule up here, and Michael's going to go into that a little bit more. But you basically are uh, putting your cues in. You can see on the far left, this is what my view looked like as I was performing. So I actually had to make sure, that those are my cues on the left, so I would trigger each one. Uh, so that actually makes it when you're performing in headset, you're kind of doing multiple things. You've usually got one earpiece in for Discord, which is your stage manager, then you've got your other earpiece in for the show, and then you're usually manipulating a couple things on the side, and then our key, uh, our key stage manager, Brendan, will usually also have a third, <laughs> a third, maybe a fourth um, audio input, so it really requires you to multitask. And let's see, so um, when, <laughs> Who is this guy up here? Apparently, um, I make such a good crypto bro that I scared everyone away. <laughs> so here we, here we have our avatars. We used um, a bunch of different things for avatars. Ready Player Me, who's, I don't know if anyone here is um, familiar with them, but uh, you can see our biohacker friend here showed up in the lobby. So the, the performance starts in the lobby. We had our lobby created by members of Active Replica and that helps everyone get inside. So you all saw earlier today, for those of you who arrived early, thank you, uh, you saw me come out into the audience, and that's actually what I would do and what other folks of us do when we have a show. Because you're not dealing with necessarily 100 people or you know 1,000 people or some kind of Broadway side show. We're kind of dealing with a small number, maybe up to 12, could be up to 20, depending on the day. So you really have that personal connection with everyone who's there, right? Like we do right here. The, this kind of theater is so different. It's so different. It's not like this. We're not separate. We're not on the stage. You're right next to that person. And that means so much. It's tender. You, it's a huge responsibility to, to, to be around people like this and to be interacting with them. And so one of the things for me was, that was big was consent. Uh, part of my show, was to transform people into different avatars. Um, and this is not a new thing. There are a lot of shows where as a, an audience member, as a participant, you take upon a different avatar. So that's not new. But um, this show was about embodiment and <laughs> it's about a lot of different things. But basically, uh, in transforming people, I wanted them to know that something might happen. So as part of Onboard, what we do is kind of give people the option to put on a different vest, uh, if they like, as part of their little robot avatar. So if they wear an orange vest, that means, hey, I can speak to you. Um, so that's something that really helps. You know, and even here in this physical space, it's easier for me, of course, to interact with these folks right up front, yeah, <laughs> than it is in the back. But we know that the people in the back are still present too. So we try to kind of do everything we can to play to all parts of the audience so everyone's gonna get an experience where 
they feel you know fun, they feel challenged in how much they want to feel challenged in the show, but then they're able to kind of enjoy themselves. And so one of the last things that I want to speak to is, uh, it's related to bringing the audience forth, okay? And I call it cross-reality, transmedia, okay, those are not new. So I'm calling it wave-based performance cycles. So in this uh, show, we had, 12, we had 12 shows, and I basically took the whole thing as a research experiment. The show itself was a reality show, so it was a meta-meta show. While we were preparing for the show, I was on Twitter posting clues, and so I wanted to engage people who didn't have the resources or the access to come to the show, and that they could actually create the show together with the audience that was going to be there. So both before the show, during the show, I was adding clues on Twitter, I was actually speaking clues to the audience, and depending on what they did, they would unlock different characters, they would unlock different narratives, and they actually unlocked, eventually, the boss mode. So the boss mode, <laughs> so we had a bunch of different uh, avatars, right? So the boss mode that we unlocked was the mega plant, Audrey, and everyone got to be a giant Audrey and jump all around the stage. Before that, they had been little barnacles locked in place, and how does that feel, right? So it's bringing that experience forward. So I had a real blast doing that, and <laughs> thanks to everyone who came, and now Michael is going to talk about how to put it all together, and he kept us going. <laughs> so thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, sweet. Hello, everyone. I am Michael Moran, and I'm going to be talking about the more technical side of how we've customized the social VR platform for something it was not designed to do at all for queue building. So just a bit about me first. Uh, I am from Austin, Texas, and uh, when the pandemic hit, I was studying to be an actor at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, and thanks to the course that Brendan founded at NYU, I was able to quickly transition to performing in virtual reality while all of my peers were stuck on Zoom. Big improvement. Um, <laughs> now, uh, over the last two years, I have been focusing on, more on the technical side of this work, learning to code and design these experiments in social VR. Now, currently, when I'm not working with these fine folks, I am producing live events uh, with Active Replica, a company from Vancouver that specializes in engaging communities in social VR. Um, and while many of my friends have gone back to performing in real life and doing in real life acting in New York, I have been left fascinated by this field and the challenge of making it more engaging and more accessible to participants. So I want to rewind back to the fall of 2020 when Brendan was first prototyping with Mozilla Hubs, with what would become the original onboard group. Um, now I'm going to talk about queuing throughout this, but a queue is any virtual effect that can be triggered and experienced live by an audience. The folks in the back are triggering our mics, the lights, um, but in WebXR, Alex Coulomb, David Goshfeld, and Roman Militich were doing their queuing in those earliest days by copying and pasting code directly into the developer tools and hitting enter very frantically at the precise moment that things needed to be triggered. This was very cumbersome and not scalable <laughs> at all. For, for Onboard 2, when I joined as a show creator, David and Roman have built out that series of buttons that you saw in Rebecca's slide, which allowed creators like me to create cues of my own and uh, trigger them without having to copy and paste code. Now, for Onboard, this was revolutionary and laid the founda foundation for the queuing system for what it would become. The only problem was that no one wanted to use it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for Onboard 3 and 4, I will work closely with David and Roman to address this issue of why no one was using the queuing system. Um, and drawing from our experience as show creators and our theater background, we were able to identify some key areas that needed that improvement. The first was, while we had been piggybacking off of Mozilla Hubs' networking system, the series of messages that allow you to see other avatars moving through the space, we laid down the foundation for our own networking <coughs> system, which would be tailored specifically to our queues and allow us to have more control over what we could trigger. Um, next, we built out the queues that we thought would make it worthwhile for our participants to engage with this still very prototyped and cumbersome uh, technology. This includes support for live music that Brendan was doing, more complex animations, and also manipulating the audience, stretching them into spaghetti, um, and moving them throughout the space. 
Lastly, we created documentation and a workflow that would allow creators with zero coding experience to access this tool. Um, and it worked. While we only had about 20 queues between onboard one and two, for onboard three and four, we had about 200 queues each. Um, this, along with my work with Brendan, Clem's projects, and the other projects using the system, have led to about 900 to 1,000 queues made with this system in the, uh, the last year, which I think is equivalent to maybe three-hour-long three shows in the real world. So I want to quickly walk you through how you would use the system as it is now if you were one of our next participants. We would start with a technical intake session where uh, Brendan and I would walk you through your idea for your project and uh, talk about how the queuing system could bring your, uh, bring your show to life. You would then create a paper tech, which is a term we borrowed from the theater community, of just a long spreadsheet of all the events that are meant to happen in your show. Then uh, we also have a queuing menu, I should say, where you can choose from all of the different queues that we've made and uh, which are available to everyone. Uh, then you would hand off your paper tech to us and we would meticulously translate it into code. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we would pass it back to you uh, uh, once, once we built and test it and you would continue to rehearse um, all the way up to showtime, which is stressful. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we will stay in dialogue to continue translating it into big JSON objects like this. So that's the current state of the queuing system, but we're really excited to talk about our goals for the future and where we see it being most useful. So first of all, we're always working to make it more accessible to our creators. Our first order of business is to finish the queue building interface, which will remove the need for people like me to translate your code and text you at 1 a.m. like, what, what the heck did you mean by this queue? Um, and then second, we want to reach the creator communities on other WebXR platforms out there. These are just a handful of those web-first platforms which are currently doing live events and could benefit from a tool like this and our experience. Uh, and lastly, we are excited to, down the road, build out other systems for ticketing and audience moderation, which will improve the experience of our audiences. So far, we've focused primarily on the experience of our creators, but we think that the audience experience is what is truly uh, needs to be improved upon for our creators' work to be uh, elevated. So this brings me to the last bit of my presentation where I just want to talk about my fascination with making these events more accessible uh, to audiences and to our storytellers. I, we've done uh, dozens of live events on, this platform, on these platforms in the last 12 months, and the most exciting ones have been when we have been able to quickly onboard a performer with their own established practice, their own community in real life, not much technical experience, into the platform quick, quickly and confidently. Now, there's uh, a lot of credit due to the Mozilla Hubs team for building such an open platform that has allowed us to hack away um, but we are excited to be that further, further link to the people that might not know, uh, might not have that technical know-how or experience to make sure that they can get up to speed and uh, not have to spend years iterating and, uh, and prototyping on this. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to someone who has spent years <laughs> prototyping and iterating on this platform. Clemence de Vague is going to talk about her work bringing her dance practice to the platform. Thank you, Michael. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Clemence de Begg. I am a weird mix between a choreographer with background in UX and XR design and I'm also a creative technologist. I'm coming here talking to you as the artistic director of Unwired Dance Theatre, and I've had the chance to work on four performances with Onboard XR. So if you remember this roadmap, basically I've been around for four of them. For a bit of context, what we do at Unwired, uh, we are a dance company. We work with technology. Um, before starting working with virtual reality, we were already working with technology, but bringing it in the meat space. So it's a very embodied practice. This is a movement practice. And we also build audience interaction in what we do. So when we started working in virtual reality, we were very excited about the potential of working with modular hubs for an accessibility uh, point of view, where the audience could come in with us in this space very, very easily. But from a movement practice, we moved from this to this, where we ended up being a head and two hands. So how do we translate our entire body into that virtual space? 
So thanks to Onboard XR, we've been able to experiment and go on this journey of how to bring digital embodiment and movement into WebXR. The first thing we did was presenting a piece called Strings Underwater, where well, we went with the video uh, option to really work on how to integrate this 2D feed to really represent the movement into that 3D space. So we worked on things like overlays to make it look like it's coming out of a video and having kind of a neat experience in there. Second uh, prototype we built was another iteration of strings where this performance is actually interactive with wearables uh, that the audience can interact with and decide how that affects the movement of the dancer. And this is the first one where we started building interactions straight into the world uh, for the audience to interact. And then after that, we moved to working with motion capture, which I will go into more details a little bit later. And then the last uh, performance we did, we had two performers in real time in the space from two different locations in full mocap. So moving from bringing video in uh, to customizing the code base to create some custom interactions to bringing some live motion capture to having two performers in the space at the same time. That all started from uh, this performance here, which is the second one, Strings the Prisoner, where we started looking at what's happening in the code base. Uh, and that really allowed us to understand how we can bring the rest of our ecosystem that we already had with Unwired into Mozilla Hubs. We started understanding how to build custom interactions, but also how to create some data feed from um, the outside of Mozilla Hubs uh, into into the system or vice versa to connect the different parts of what we do. Thanks to that, that gave us an understanding of how to bring maybe other experiences. And in that journey of bringing dance and motion into <laughs> WebXR, well, we happened to have had access to a mocap suit and we were really thinking, okay, we've got the tech, we've got the hardware, how can we make this happen live into the virtual space? Um, that led to unwanted waters. So this piece of work has been a lot of prototyping, a lot of iterations to understand how to bring the motion capture data live into the space. Let me show you a quick video so you've got an idea of what's happening in that performance. So as I was saying, for us, it was really interesting to have this combination between live motion, uh, but also having the audience present in the space. So let me walk you through a little bit of how that works. First of all, this little guy <laughs> hasn't disappeared. <laughs> the three-point tracking is still there in Mozilla Hubs. What we did is kind of a big hack to bring the motion capture data into the, um, the virtual environment. So what we're doing is we're bringing and we're loading a model that is fully rigged uh, via 3.js, so completely customizing the code base, and then turning the avatar that's behind completely invisible, and then puppeteering this uh, 3D model that's been loaded with the motion capture data that's coming through. So we are sniffing the data out of the motion capture software that's proprietary, sending this to a remote server, and then bringing this into Mozilla Hubs to puppeteer that um, virtual character. Beyond the technical challenge, that was a massive challenge. <laughs> that was also the challenge of well, what do we do now as performers in full mocap, in a headset, in actually a tiny living room. So my living room is about three by three meters. How do we make this happen to make sure that this is safe and then the performance can actually you know, translate what's happening uh, with our bodies? So there's a few challenges there. That's my living room. Um, it's tiny. <laughs> First of all, uh, it's making the most out of the garden and the pass-through. So I've got this trick where I draw on the floor some uh, shapes to really understand where are the key elements in my physical space. So I would draw an arrow to understand what's the front 
uh, and it also where's my TV? And then I would draw another shape on the side and then where's my sofa? So at any moment when I'm performing, I have this double perception of the physical space and the virtual space. Secondly, as my living room is tiny, <laughs> as I said, um, it's also understanding how to expand that possibility and how to perform in a much bigger virtual space while being in a tiny physical space. So I've been mapping the motion capture data with where I am in the virtual space through the joystick and then really working on my on-the-spot walk <laughs> to pretend that I'm walking in a much, much, much bigger, bigger space. That allowed me to perform throughout the entire lockdown in that living room to real life audiences. On top of that, what was really interesting in our press, oh, sorry, I'm moving too fast. Next step, we've been bringing two, performance, uh, two performers in real time simultaneously into different locations. So I perform from London and I've been working with Christian Morabito based in New York and we were both in full mocap in our headset um, performing in real time in that virtual space. We're gonna expand, bringing more people in there as well, I hope. Um, so based on that, we kind of carry on working on a long form, uh, thinking about how we're bringing more performers in this space. Lastly, um, I want also to share a little bit about some of the learnings along the way. The motion capture data is so good <laughs> that a lot of people during our play tests told us, well, is this really happening live? Like, is this not animated, pre-animated? Uh, so we've been working on really thinking about how do we bring this uh, perception of liveness into that virtual performance, uh, so, which is something that is really important for us uh, at Unwired. So first of all, we built uh, portals that gave a, a, a vision of what's happening in the real space while we are performing in mocap. So having that um, kind of moment of passage through the portal, and that really helped the audience to click as it, okay, oh, this is mocap, I can see the motion capture suit. So they can get this out of the way and then focus on the narrative afterwards. And then secondly, really integrating um, audience interaction and audience participation as part of the narrative and as part of the performance. Uh, so they are part of the story, so that can only happen live if what they do in the space has an impact on what's happening. So in uh, the images you can see here, we are bringing them through um, uh, those kind of circles on the floor. The full narrative is about a rite of passage when you kind of gain attributes on your avatar. And we've been doing this uh, between the two performers and during the performance, we're bringing them with us and we're changing their avatars when they are moving with us in the space. We are working on the long form. So if you are curious about what we're gonna do, please check out our work. We're also live streaming once per week to share our process with mocap on Twitch every Sunday. So please um, follow our work and thank you very much, Brendan. And you can follow everybody uh, at their Twitter here, but we also have a little bit of time left if there's things we've talked about. We tried to go over 18 months of exploration in a very short amount of time. So if there's any follow-up questions to any of the individuals here, um, we'd love to chat more about. Putting your story, yes sir, or yes ma'am. Yes, in the distance, the, I cannot see the human, I see the hand. Uh, when you were talking about the, uh, the live performance from the UK to the US, what's your experience on latency? Um, interestingly, so I've been working a lot with telematics in, in the past, um, interestingly, Issues we've had in the past with latency in doing things on Zoom and so on have actually been a little bit more fixed <laughs> with the process we adopted here. So latency is still there. We have to integrate it. This is no way around that. Uh, but the motion capture data is so light in terms of um, building this stream that it's much faster than streaming video, for example. So latency got completely reduced. The second benefit as well is from a music point of view. Most of the time when you're um, working, let's say, let's, uh, on Zoom to work on a telematic performance, the audio will come from one of the sources. And that creates a latency for the remote performer that has to adapt to when the sound's gonna reach there. In this setup, we've been choreographing already in the virtual space, and the audio is also sent to the virtual space. And then we're receiving pretty much at the same time-ish. Um, instead of having one person hearing it in real time and the other person hearing it with latency. So we had to react with the same latency, uh, which helped us to be in sync. And that, that made a massive difference. So we have been able to start choreographing proper set movement on 
uh, certain counts on the music, which we had to kind of forget about while doing other telematic work. I just have a quick question on um, how you guys are approaching sort of uh, really finding audiences or I think you mentioned some of the performers that come with an audience it was sort of easier but because I think that's always that how do you draw the the crowd to this amazing work you guys are doing it's like you know sure um, I can talk about that a little bit from like a business perspective um, I come primarily I come first from more web 2.0 especially streaming video communities um, like early web series work and I think what I found to be successful is that if you build a show you spend all this time doing audience curation and identification around a singular show, and then the show ends, and then you start all over again. And in some ways, building a community of Onboard and letting the brand of Onboard contain any artist's show, the artists benefit from day one having a built-in Onboard audience, but then anybody who comes to Onboard might then experience new work. So for example, what I love most about Onboard is I would have never worked with Clem in my life. I would have, I love dance, but I don't go to a lot of dance, and I certainly wasn't gonna go to the UK for dance. So in some ways, someone would come see Clem's work and maybe suddenly see Rebecca's work, um, or might come to see my work and then suddenly be introduced to Clem's work. And so I think that that audience sharing has allowed us to really foster a, an exponential community. Um, it's also then when we have more client-based work or main stage-based work, we're being approached by someone who has a built-in audience that they're looking to service with content. Um, which then also introduces them to our entire community. Um, so for example, that IMAX project that I did, um, they were interested in, in my work, but they are also now aware of all the other onboard XR artists and also other virtual reality and virtual performances in general. So they then asked me about like, well, who else is working in this space and what are they doing? Um, and so we've seen a lot of kind of knowledge, not only knowledge sharing, but audience sharing, which is really exciting. Yes. So you mentioned the hybrid work that you did at the IMAX theater, and there's been collaboration with some of these like larger festivals. What do you see? That do you see more hybrid opportunities in the future? More opportunities to get featured at festivals? I'm curious about kind of like how that evolves over time with Onboard. I think that everybody with a creative practice would have a different answer to that, <laughs> um, which is what's great is that they have the toolkit to kind of take off and, and do as they like. Um, for me, I, I always love being amongst humans. Um, hybrid performance to me is very exciting. I also, in the quarantine of it all, saw the theater community respond to this work as sort of a threat, weirdly. Um, and I think that there is some teaching that we're not like coming for theater um, in some ways that we can work together and not only create meaningful work on site, but also then open it up to a broader audience. And again, that's, access that's accessibility, because I think accessibility is not just the tools of do you have hardware, do you have software, but there's, there, are, there are audience members who cannot access or do not feel safe to access our current uh, theater venues, um, or they do not feel invited to those spaces. And I think that this work has the potential of reaching those communities that have not been invited to our storytelling tradition. Hi, uh, great, amazing work. Uh, I'm just wondering, how do you see it scaling up? Uh, like a lot of the stuff you mentioned about getting, the, I mean, from a technical point of view and also from a creative design point of view with a larger audience, um, because it seems to me that, you know, trying to do live motion capture and like streaming 3D environment and all of that through the web is like, not uh, very optimal, uh, like game engines, you know, like Unreal have done that like much better, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, who, who can access the app and stuff like that. And, and then like from the point of view of the participants, if you want to have hundreds of participants, how is that going to impact how you design the show and those kind of um, challenges? I think if I understand your question, it's how does it, scale to invite more audience and artist um, based off of what's being done in like game engines and things like that. Um, is that true? So both technical and, and then, you know, creative design of the show. Cool. 
Um, I'll speak to creative, and then I definitely want to hear Michael talk about scaling technical. I think I will always bristle at the word better or quality in creative work, um, because I think every artist has their own aesthetic, and it's not, uh, as an audience member, you can buy a ticket and have an opinion, but I think that I always want to support whatever the vision of that artist is, whether or not it's my aesthetic or not. Um, I think what's nice about what Onboard allows is these are meant to be first looks. These is first prototyping, early drafting. In some ways, we're empowering people to not have to worry about it being fully realized or fully perfect yet, because I think that you know it's the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, we're just trying to get people empowered to start working with these tools, start feeling like this could be a part of their creative practice, and then worry about, you're absolutely right, we can put a 4K beard texture in there down the road. Um, but for now, let's see if they can actually perform in headset and if that connects to their creative practice, like the work we saw Clem do and kind of stair step. But Michael, if you could speak to where you see the technical side scaling. Yeah, our, we're, we're hoping our tools and tools that other uh, creators are making will, inc will lower the friction for people wanting to bring their work for the first time. But going back to your question about the bringing uh, people with non-technical but established practices, really, I think we all believe the opportunity of WebXR is the ease of access for audience members. And no one's fully cracked it yet, but being able to go to a URL instead of downloading multiple apps to get there um, is the technical achievement that's already there. It just needs to be accessed and, and, and utilized. I would add to that, to that as well. I, I'm reading also behind your question that there's this idea of how many people can we bring in and how do we scale the audience. Um, it's all about server performance. So, you know, at the moment we have a little bit of a limitation with how many people we can bring, but that gives us also some kind of different creative input because you don't design a show the same way if it's for 20 people or that if it is for a thousand. Um, and in a lot of the work, all the artists have been presenting this audience interaction is really important and building this intimacy is really important. Um, if we were looking at broadcasting, I don't know, a very famous person for a gig or something like this, that would be a very different consideration. So I think in all the art practices as artists, that was really important to keep it quite intimate. Um, so if we were looking at bigger, <laughs> that'd be completely different, um, which is possible, but it's a different type of work. Uh, I'll piggyback on that, because yeah. that, that actually illuminates, I think, a really cool point that may better answer the question. Uh, there is this interactivity that we can generally get about 20 users comfortably inside at a very high engagement level. Like, we're, we're going to see them, we're going to participate with them, they're going to interact with things. Michael's developed a concept of a cinematic or cinema track that is actually an animated avatar or a, a POV through the whole experience that can either be streamed out or can just be watched from the browser. So we can then have much more, a much larger number of people more passively attend the way they would a normal show or a normal movie where they're just watching that singular experience, which does start to lend itself more to that game engine audience where they're going to kind of watch from the game viewport um, of what the experience is meant to be rendered at. Yeah. Um, so that kind of brings those tiers. And we, we have three tiers of ticketing. We have a on-stage ticket. If you've been to a Broadway show where you sit on the stage and maybe get a little more interaction or a magician show where you get called up, that's the on-stage ticket um, virtually. Then we have the orchestra ticket, which is you're a ghost, but you can be moving around the space from wherever you want, but we don't see you, um, so you're not going to interrupt the action. And then we have what we call the virtual balcony, which is just a live stream out to Twitch and YouTube so that like my grandma can come to the show and she's like, I don't want to touch buttons, I just want to watch the darn thing. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one more question, and then I think we're gonna we'll be out in the in the world and coffee and stuff. But and you can contact us at Twitter. But is there one more question or one more R to send us out on? I'll make y'all R. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful presentation, by the way. Um, just to kind of wrap this up, where do you think theater and live performance will go in the future? 10 years down the road. Obviously, using Web WebXR now is, you know, addresses things like limited bandwidth, lack of ubiquitous headsets. That's all going to change. As you move into that world, do you think that theater live performance will start to have actors as they actually appear in real life? Or do you think avatars will still play a major role in that? I don't know about uh, the, the avatar side, but personally, I think for folks of my generation, live 
interaction and performance is going to be essential to actually accomplishing the metaverse. Um, I, I think folks who went through higher education, school, doing a lot of Zoom are the folks who are potentially stepping away from the metaverse right now. Um, and so I think, I, I think that engaging through live connection is going to be the most essential. I agree, I think there's a lot of opportunity for that and that's why we're here to explore and just keep creating and keep iterating and see what else comes to the table and whether that's through a new audience, uh, an audience member or, or one of our um, co-creators and that's exactly, so I'm, I'm doing a show that's kind of like you're talking about where the, uh, the avatar looks like the person physically and that's a very interesting thing to examine um, but at the same time uh, VR does provide us an amazing opportunity for folks to look like something different. So I think, you know, we're, we're plus to all of that and to see where that goes and to see where that fits. And I would hope that uh, artists will explore something different than just a human, humanoid avatar because there's so much creative possibility mm -hmm. there. Um, there is a trend at the moment, the kind of two trends that are already appearing. You can see the hyper-realistic um, side of things where we're trying to reproduce humans and getting them and passing this uncanny valley of this weird thing that kind of looks like a human uh, and but has <laughs> motion capture <laughs> issues. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but you also have the more abstract work with artists that are creating shapes that are being um, moved and animated by humans and that's also really exciting because we can tell completely different stories. Uh, we can change scales, we can change shapes. I've been a flower in the past, I have been a cloud, um, and that opens a lot of possibilities for storytelling, and that, I think that's exciting. And I would say in the future of theatre, if we can start having more of a hybrid version of that, where you've got real humans and you've got a lot of beautiful um, assets and elements that uh, contribute to the storytelling, that, for me, that I'm excited about that. This is where I want this to go, but I don't know if that's gonna be the case. <laughs> Uh, my answer to both sides of your question is that I think that I think representation in any storytelling tradition is at a show by show level, right? It's about that creative team is going to make the choices that are best to tell that story. One of my favorite experiences so far performing in VR is performing as a point of light that like responded to my voice and I like that I can't do that. And as a character <laughs> actor, please, can I turn into light? That's awesome. Um, but I think as far as where does this go in 10 years for live performance and live events, I think that if we can borrow anything from what the internet has provided us, kind of to Michael's point, is that when we can access anything all the time, there is then sort of a, um, we, we aren't activated by that. There's no appointment driving it. Um, whereas live events or live streams um, have really become the way that people can create a volume of interaction and responsiveness to build audiences and communities online. And so I think the call to action of this is happening now and live, it'll never happen again. It's why we've been telling stories around the campfire for a thousand years. And I think that we're never gonna replace it. And for me, the better the technology gets, I hope what that will require is a reliance on this thousands of year tradition of storytelling and craft that we will actually need better performers and artists that are really, really grounded in their, their creative practice. Because if the technology isn't gonna have any buffers, we need people who can sit there for 45 minutes and dance in their living room, um, somehow not bumping into their couch. Um, so I think that we'll see better artistry come out of it. Um, so yeah. 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 Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody, for being here. This was amazing.